Hello everyone welcome to my new video. This is a custom ESP32 S3 dev board I designed for one of my projects. This dev kit is based on the ESP32 S3 room with 16 megabytes of flash and 8 megabytes of PSRAM. I'm using a CH340C USB to UART chip for firmware flashing and debugging. I also integrated a single cell lithium battery charging circuit using the TP4056 along with a protection circuit. On top of that, I added some peripherals like a micro SD card slot and an RGB LED, which will be useful for future projects. This board also breaks out multiple functional headers, including UART, ADC, I2C, and SPI. I added an extra LED as well, just for basic testing like blinking during development. For the power section, I designed the board so you can choose between two common LDO options, depending on your use case and performance requirements. I'll explain this part in more detail when we get to the schematic. The original goal was very simple. Plug in USB charge the battery, unplug USB run on battery. But during testing, the charging circuit behaved completely differently from what I expected. As you can see, when I plug in the USB cable, the battery full indicator lights up immediately. The circuit doesn't switch into charging mode at all, which is clearly not what I expected. At that moment, I knew something was wrong, but the Rayall cause turned out to be far from simple. Before we dive into the debugging process, I'd like to thank PCBWay for sponsoring today's video. The boards you see here were manufactured by PCBWay, from simple two-layer PCBs to more complex custom designs. Based on my own experience, it's a service worth considering if you're working on prototypes or small hardware projects and need reliable quality with fast turnaround. Pricing starts at around $5 for five PCBs, not including shipping, and delivery typically takes about 4 to 14 days, depending on your location and the shipping option you choose. You can find the PCBWay link in the video description. Now, let's get back to the board and walk through the schematic step by step to understand where things started to go wrong. Now, I'll briefly walk you through the schematic. First, I designed the UART to TTL circuit using the CH340C, strictly following the datasheet so this part works reliably. This block here is the RGB LED circuit using WS2812B. Next, these are the GPIO expansion headers, which make it easier to connect additional peripherals. I also added a micro SD card slot for extra data storage. Next, let's talk about the 3.3V LDO low dropout regulator. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, this board is designed to use one of two LDO options. LDO 40L or AP 2112K. You should only populate one of them, depending on your requirements. They differ in performance, quality, and cost, and I'll briefly go over those differences based on the datasheets. First, let's start with the LDO 40L 3.3 volt version. This regulator can operate with an input voltage as low as 3.5 volt, and it supports a maximum output current of 400 milliamp. The dropout voltage is extremely low, about 36 mV at 100 milliamp load, and around 140 mV at 400 milliamp load. It also features a high PSRR, around 70 dB at 1 kHz, and very low output noise, roughly 20 microvolt. Because of this, it's very efficient when running on battery power, especially for low voltage applications. On top of that, the IC includes overcurrent and thermal protection, which helps protect sensitive downstream devices such as MCUs. Next, let's take a closer look at the AP2112K LDO, which is a very popular and low-cost regulator. This IC supports a maximum output current of 600 milliamp. It includes overcurrent protection, which typically triggers when the output voltage drops by about 50 millivolt beyond the rated current. The dropout voltage is around 250 millivolt at 600 milliamp output current, which is noticeably higher compared to the previous LDO. The output noise is approximately 50 microvolt, which is also higher than the LDO 40L. For the remaining specifications, you can refer to the datasheet. Here, I'm only highlighting the general specs and the key differences between these two LDOs. If you are building battery powered, energy efficient applications, I highly recommend using LDO 40L. However, for general purpose applications, 
the AP2112 k is still a solid and cost-effective choice. In the end, the right LDO depends on your application requirements. Okay, let's move on to the first mistake. This one is related to the power path logic. My original intention when adding this diode was to block reverse current from the battery back to the USB input while USB is plugged in. However, this design caused an unexpected problem. The USB power, after passing through the diode, was feeding back into the B-plus node of the battery. This B-plus node is directly connected to the BAT pin of the TP4056, which resulted in a constant voltage of around 4.6 volts appearing on the BAT pin. Because of this, the TP4056 incorrectly detected the battery as fully charged, so the charging process was immediately disabled, and the charge done LED, D1, stayed on all the time. I was honestly surprised that I made such a basic mistake. The key issue here is that the TP4056 is a linear charger IC and does not include an integrated power path management circuit. This was purely a design oversight caused by not carefully reading the datasheet. Some people might ask, why not just add a diode to create an OR diode circuit so that current can flow if any input is high and when all inputs are low, the output voltage drops low as well. In theory, this works, but there is a major drawback. Power loss and voltage drop. For a simple example, when the battery is fully charged at around 4.2 volts, after passing through a diode with about 0.3 volts of forward voltage drop, the usable voltage becomes only around 3.9 volts. This means you cannot fully utilize the battery capacity, and the efficiency of both the battery and the LDO is significantly reduced. So instead of using a diode, the simplest solution I chose was to replace the diode with a jumper. If I'm using battery power, I do not short the USB jumper. USB is used only for charging, firmware flashing, and debugging. If I'm not using the battery and only powering from USB, I simply short the jumper and run directly from USB power. Of course, there is a better and cleaner solution. Use a different power management IC that integrates battery charging, protection, and power path management, such as the IP5306, which is quite popular and widely used. Okay, now I'm going to remove this D6 diode. After removing the diode, I plug in the USB and, as you can see, only a few LEDs turn on. Next, I jumper the diode back and the board works normally like before. Now I connect the battery while the board is powered, then plug the USB in again. As you can see, the charging yellow LED turns on, that means the charging circuit is finally working. Everything now behaves exactly as I originally intended. You can replace this diode with a switch, which is more effective if you plan to use two power sources. In my case, this board is mainly battery powered, so I don't really need a power source selector switch. I've put the full schematic and PCB files in the video description. Feel free to download them and modify the design to suit your own needs. This is the end of the video. Thank you guys for taking the time to watch. I'll be using this board for a few projects in the future, so stay tuned. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, and give me a subscribe. It really helps the channel. See you in the next videos, and I wish you all success in your own projects.